dengan kita live daripada uh, New York untuk kita uh, sama-sama mempelajari mengenai dengan uh, apakah uh, pandangan, apakah uh, cara-cara uh, uh, guru ini uh, mengenalkan flip classroom di dalam keadaan-keadaan yang pandemik. Ya. Jadi dengan tidak buang masa, saya akan berbicara dalam bahasa Inggeris Uh, untuk menjemput dan uh, bercerita sedikit mengenai dengan Cik Hassan Rusun. Uh, good evening Mr Hassan. Uh, welcome to uh, TVET Renoms our webinar that we are having uh, quite occasionally especially in these times of pandemic. This is our third session that we have had uh, since 2020 and this is the first series that we have had in 2021. So you're part of the first episode. We'll be having this throughout the whole year and uh, every month we'll be inviting people to come in and share their practices and their expertise and, and be part of a larger community to help our lecturers in the Malaysian Polytechnics and College community uh, to carry out their duties in this trying and difficult times. So uh, we're very honored to have you, uh, Mr. Hassan. And let me just read a bit about you because I've got about two pages of of uh, stuff for me to read. So that will take, I think, about easily an hour. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Hassan Wilson uh, is uh, is a person who has won the award-winning educator recognized by as a top hundred innovative teachers and members of the Board of Trustees. Probably that is the first thing you have got to give us a bit of insight. What does that mean uh, to, be, to, to, to be nominated as the top 100 innovative, innovative teachers? And uh, what, what does it take and how do they award it to you? Maybe that is an interesting introduction uh, before we kick in into uh, the rest of your presentation. Also, uh, Mr. Hassan Wilson is the assistant head of upper, of upper school and uh, he's been very, very active in flip teaching, a flip classroom. And this is how Dr. Umar got in touch with, uh, with him. And we have been, and then uh, we feel that it's very much uh, in line with what we want to do and what we want to learn and how we're going to introduce this kind of innovative teaching practices in, uh, in, in, in Malaysia. As you know that we are very much in a TVET environment. I do not know whether that's the, that's the correct term that America uses. I think you call it professional practices, but what TVET means is technical, vocational, education, and, and, and training. Uh, you may call it VET, vocational, education, training. I'm really not sure how American uh, phrases it, but that's what we are. So most of our subjects and our lecturers are uh, doing more practical hands-on work uh, deal that deals with either engineering or services or uh, those kind of uh, programs and syllabus. And now with the pandemic, uh, everybody's going online as much as possible. Uh, we're having challenges as to how the practical elements are being brought, should be brought in, into an online environment. We have still not, uh, not uh, solved that problem. Maybe Hassan, you would take it towards the end of your presentation. You would uh, also sort of suggest to us where to go and in search for anyone who, who has this kind of uh, expertise. would be very, very grateful. Okay, without further ado, uh, Hassan, uh, I'll pass the, uh, you can't say the floor, you can't say the mic. I'll pass the bandwidth to you. Maybe that's, that's the right term. Okay, and uh, probably you begin by introducing yourself just a bit. And we are very excited to know about this top 100 innovative uh, lecturers. So, all to you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. I don't know if I should spend more time talking about myself and want to dive into the content. Um, so, yes, I'm Hassan Wilson, um, and I'm the assistant head of upper school at a independent school in New York City, a Friends Seminary. I've been there almost 20 years. Um, I also do some other stuff um, related to online teaching. So I am a, a staff developer. So that means I lead professional development for teachers uh, who teach online, actually. Um, I, I work with an organization called Constellation Learning, 
and they have been doing online courses for years. Uh, and so I help them with, you know, I uh, consult and do trainings for multiple schools in the United States in addition to my normal job. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and show some slides. Just give me a moment. So if you would like to stay connected with me I'd, uh, on Twitter, I'm at Wilson's Biolab. You can see my information in the lower left-hand corner. And the agenda, what I want to cover today, falls into four categories. Uh, first is communication. So this is how you communicate with your students online and how they communicate with each other. The second is platform. So that's where you host your content. So you have a learning management system like Google Classroom or PowerSchool or something or a website. Uh, the third category is learner experience and content. Uh, and then the last thing I want to touch on today are, are the use of videos and video conferencing. Um, and so just to give you some background, as I mentioned, I've been a staff developer uh, for teachers who teach online for a few years now. And when the pandemic started uh, and, and it became clear uh, in my school community that we were not going to come back to face-to-face -to -face learning for some time, uh, we were at the beginning of spring break and it became clear to me that we we're most likely not coming back. Uh, the, the COVID numbers were increasing in New York City um, and we actually started spring break early because we were nervous about the virus spreading. Um, so I knew my colleagues and other educators um, did not have the experience with online teaching and learning that I, that I had. Uh, so what I did is I wrote a, a, a pamphlet or a brochure, uh, um, a document, about a 25 page document that sort of gave some tips and best practices for online learning. Because um, I was nervous that teachers were used to having the face-to-face -face brick and mortar classes, but they didn't have the experience with online teaching and learning. So the presentation that I'm giving today, I'm drawing on some of those best practices that I identified uh, and shared with my uh, school, com school community. Um, so for community, we're, we're going to start with communication. And I want to point out that you see the images next to each agenda item. That lets you know which uh, agenda item we're on. Uh, so you see this image with the face. That means we're talking about communication. The little schoolhouse means we're talking about platform and on and on. And, you know, in, in these webinars, it's really tough to have, you know, a back and forth dialogue. And so even though we may not be able to consistently talk throughout this presentation, I, I do want to give you time to think about what I'm saying. So you notice that on my slides, I don't have the title screen, the title yet. I'm going to talk through a best practice. And then I'm going to pause and let you think about what do you think the best practice or the takeaway is from what I'm talking about. And if you can just drop that into the chat, you know, I think he's talking about this. That'd be great. It'd be a good way for you to engage with the content. So um, looking at the, the top left hand corner, that is the image of um, email platform. Email is a great way to communicate. Um, with students in the online class, um, but it is very limiting too. Um, and I worry about, you know, if we're flooding each other's inboxes, then that's that's not in a very effective way to communicate. But email can be a good way to communicate if a student has uh, an issue or a problem or a question that's pertinent to their own personal situation. Um, so email is a good way to 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 deal with personal matters. On the right hand side, you can see that that's an image of a discussion board. Discussion boards or online discussion threads are great ways to communicate asynchronously. So you don't have to be online at the same time um, as your students. Same thing with email, that can be done asynchronously. Those are asynchronous ways of communicating. 
The benefit of the discussion thread is that the other students get to see the question and get to see the answer. Um, so, you know, you have to think about whether if, if it's a personal matter, obviously email is the best way to do that. But if you think that there are certain things that can be um, of benefit of other students in your class to see these questions and answers, a discussion board is a great way to do that. And so, yes, you can have discussion boards that's about the content, and I definitely encourage the use of discussion boards for content. But you might also want somewhere on your platform to have a place where students can ask questions about the course. So whether it's about grading or whether it's about what's happening in the course, that is a good and, and you can encourage other students to answer that question. So a lot of times I before I even get to the discussion board, I've seen that classmates have answered the question and then I can go in and say, yes, Bob has the right answer to this question. This is the way we're doing things. So those are asynchronous ways of communicating. But you're also going to need synchronous ways of communicating. But sometimes it's great to just be in the moment and being able to, you know, students to ask you a question and you to give them an answer right in the moment and for there to be follow up questions. Um, on a lower right hand side, you see that 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 links to an article that that gives you advice or ways to add a chat room to your platform. Uh, chat rooms are great ways to have text conversations in the moment. Um, and then, of course, we know about video webinars. So we're using a video, uh, a video platform right now. Um, there's Zoom, Microsoft Teams, Google Hangouts. Those are also, also good ways of communicating synchronously face-to-face. Uh, -face. And then the, the lower left-hand side is that when you do have these synchronous discussions, you, you need to have a way to book those appointments. So if you use Google Calendar, I know th there's a, a way on Google Calendar to add appointment slots to your calendar, and then the student can click on the, the time that they want, and it automatically get added to your calendar as well as to the student's calendar. Uh, so communication is, there's a lot of things you have to think about communication with your students. So I just want to give you 10 seconds to think about what do you think is the take home message? What am I saying about communication with your students in your class? Give you a few more seconds just to drop some things into the chat. And the point I'm trying to make is that you want to have real time and asynchronous ways to communicate with your students. So you want to be thinking about what are the sort of real face to face where we're talking at the same time and ways that we can communicate asynchronously. Also, we're on communication. On the left hand side, um, this is an image of a video that I made and I I teach science, um, a, a biotechnology. And when I in my online classes, when I want students to do something at home or some kind of lab activity, I always have a video. Um, when I teach live in a brick and mortar class, I sometimes have videos, um, but when you're when you're in a brick and mortar class, you have the opportunity to stop your students and, and say, wait, everyone, you're doing this wrong. Let, let's pause and let me show you the right way to do this step. But in an online class, you don't have that opportunity because they're doing the labs and the activities home and you're not there with them. You're usually not doing it at the same time. Um, so uh, a video is a great way to make your instructions even clearer because they can see you following the steps. On the right hand side, there are times where my instructions are written, but I want to make sure I have images and screenshots to show um, what I mean in my written instructions. And so in a brick in a brick mortar class, you have, like I said, you, you have the opportunity to be able to clarify your instructions, but 
client class, you have to front load those instructions. Uh, so what do you think is the take home message from what I just presented? So you can drop that into the chat. Can you see the chat, Hassan? Excuse me? Yeah. Yeah. All right. There are some, yeah, there are already some points there. Sorry? There are about five points there. Uh, mm -hmm. They say it's two, two way communication is important. In Malaysia, we use WhatsApp groups to communicate with our students. Uh, key screenshots. We use telegrams. That's uh, basically that's what they're saying. Yeah. Right. I right. Have, a, have a question for you uh, at this moment, uh, Hassan. I mean, why do you start off with uh, communication as your first topic? Uh, why is it that important? Uh, for an online uh, class, is there is there any reason behind it? Yes, I think because. Excuse me, I was where that go. Um, yes, I think communication is the most important thing for an online class because again, you're very limited with what you can do in the online class, and when you're in a, a live brick and mortar class. You, there's so many ways that you can communicate with your students and to clarify things. You you know you see your students in the you bump bump into them in the hallways or on campus, and you're able to clarify. And, and them seeing you on campus gives them also reminders of things that they have to do. In an online class, they're really limited to what you post online, so they're not getting the benefit of some of those informal communication. So you have to be really um, diligent and, and thoughtful about your communication. So that's why I want to start with this. Okay. I like I like the fact that you're saying even though you are not communicating, you are communicating, you know, the way that they, when they see you in, in class or outside of class, suddenly they 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 remember that they've got an assignment or questions to ask. So that that that, that sort of thing is what is missing in an online environment. Good. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So for this tip, you want to give more instructions than than you normally would have to do in a brick and mortar class. Um, so using video images are great ways to uh, communicate uh, your instructions. The next tip, uh, also communication. I think there's an echo. I wonder. If, I think on your end, you're not on mute. There we go. That. There we go. All right. Um, when you have an assignment, a larger assignment, um, I would consider breaking down deadlines to breaking down the larger assignment into smaller assignments and give deadlines to those different steps. Um, so what you see here is this was a sort of a, a build, uh, a model building project that they had. And they actually had to submit a plan to me in advance of the deadline. Um, and what that allowed me to do is to see if they were on the right track. It also ensured that they had to work on the assignment before the deadline. Um, because what you, what you find in online classes, because again, you don't have that consistent bumping into the hallways or bumping, you know, seeing each other on campus and those sort of informal reminders, that in an online class, it's easier for a student to let the work pile up and to try to do it all right before the deadline. And you might say, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm teaching older people, I'm teaching adults, they should be responsible for, you know, keeping track of, of their work. And I think that's a fair point. But I think if I want to ensure or maximize the quality of the work, as an online teacher, there are things you're going to have to do that that's being helpful that maybe you wouldn't do in a brick and mortar class. And I think having these these sort of deadlines, dividing up larger tasks into smaller tasks and having deadlines for different pieces is a way that you as the online teacher can be helpful and, and, and prevent students from falling behind. Now we're going to move on to platform. 
So again, platform is where are you hosting your content and how you're hosting your content. What you see here are images. I, I use a platform called PowerSchool, but I, I've used Google Classroom and um, other platforms, a like Canvas um, I've used. And, um, and your pages and your content, you have to really be really mindful of what is your organizational strategy? So are you dividing your content by time? You know, like week one, week two, week three. Is it by topic, you know, um, photosynthesis, cellular respiration, et cetera, et cetera. Or are you, are you combining both of those? Um, I had a course that I was teaching to adults, to teachers about standards-based grading. And so it made sense for me to actually divide my content by learning targets and levels. So page one was level one, and then the next page was level two, level three, level four. Um, so what do you think the tip I'm trying to convey to you here? So you can jot down some ideas into the chat. Right. So you want to be mindful of how you organize your content, and whether it's by time, topic, or some other structure that makes sense. And you want to do that consistently. So make sure if it's by time, your whole course is organized by time. You don't want to switch strategies. Right. Again, learning to, um, still on uh, platform. On the left, you see that this is an image of a video that I make. Um, you see that this is what I call a framing video. So for every week, I have a framing video that talks about this is what we're doing this week. These are the important things for you to know for this week. Um, in addition, I also do it in a way I try not to just sit behind a computer screen you know, like I'm doing right now. Um, and I try to personalize it a little bit. So you can see in this video, I'm actually walking around in my neighborhood. And so the reason why I'm doing that is because, again, you're you're an online teacher. You don't have the benefit of those informal conversations. So you want to do whatever you can to personalize your course, personalize your content. If they feel some kind of connection to you as a teacher, like, oh, wow, look at his neighborhood or, you know, maybe you're on the beach, you know, you're or wherever, you know, maybe you're, you know, by your favorite record store or something, something to personalize your course, because those sort of informal connections that increases the motivation. If they feel a connection to you, they're more likely to do what you want them to do. Um, and I think we notice in a brick and mortar class, we have ways to connect with our students. Um, but because we're online teachers, we don't have the benefit of that. So wherever you can build that into your course is really helpful. So in my framing video, I talk about, hey, you're gonna need these supplies the, later in this week. We're gonna have a quiz on this. Just give them a heads up what's happening in the week. I also combine that with a to-do list for the week. So the first thing they see on the, the week's page is my video and a list. This is everything we're gonna do for the week. I even put deadlines so they know this is what's happening through the week. I also include verbs. So you can see on the list says discuss or do or watch so that they're very clear that for step four, they're watching something. For step six, they're doing something. Step two, oh, that's an online discussion. Um, so you want them to, you want to give them as much information as possible. So if you can pop into the chat, what do you think um, I am saying here? What do you think is the tip? Let's see, they are saying that, uh, yeah, you need to be well prepared uh, so that you, your students understand your, your structure and content. Personalized learning is, is important. Yes, I would agree. I really like your idea of having that uh, environment where you are not in a brick and mortar environment. 
you're walking around in your in your neighborhood and so on. Uh, those are the things that make uh, makes uh, online learning different and more effective. And I, I think you really uh, sort of uh, understood its it, its its uh, potential that you use it very well. Uh, so uh, let's see. Oh, there's one question here that I think they they want to know how are you can. Uh, this is a longer question. If you can go scroll scroll up a bit, uh, they they want to know how do you know that students are responding to your structure? How 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 can you sort of uh, do you do you check on them or is there any way to know that they are responding to your structure? Yeah, I I, I think the the best way, you know, especially in an online course, I know you probably have heard of those MOOCs where the kid, the students, they log on, they, they, and they quit after a week or after a few days. Um, so the, the best indicator that what you're doing is working is your students are doing what you ask. If they are completing your assignments, and for the most part, they're, they're, they're done well and on time, then you know that you've hit the mark. If you're having troubles with students doing your work, then it might be something on their end, but it also could be something that you're doing or not doing that that that's not allowing them to fully engage with your content. I'm so I'm going to move on to the next category. So we're moving on to learner experience and content. Um, this was the you know when as I mentioned that when the pandemics first sort of it became clear that we were not coming back to school. Um, we had just finished our third quarter. We we're going to our fourth quarter. I was teaching a biotech class and the final unit was DNA barcoding. And I was really excited to, 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 to have this last unit. And it was gonna culminate in a project in which they were, um, they were submitting their work to a competition. So they had already written their proposals they knew what they were going to, to do in this last unit. Um, it was very lab intensive. And then obviously we could not do it. You know, um, you know they I needed the use of centrifuges and, and micropipettes um, and um, gel electrophoresis, et cetera. They need DNA samples. Um, so it was clear to me, we're not gonna do that fourth quarter. There's no way we can do that at, at home. Um, so, the, one, the, the tip here is that you're going to have to rethink what you do. You know, there are things that lend themselves well to in-person learning, but not online learning, and vice versa. And there are things that lend themselves well to online learning. Um, and so, I would say don't fall in love with what you do if that means that you're going to power through it e anyway even though um, it doesn't work in, in the online setting. Um, so that might mean, and you have to have conversations with your department chairs, that maybe there are certain topics that don't make sense to have um, in a particular unit because it's online. Um, and it's not just the content that you teach. It might be what you have your students doing, how you assess your students. You may have to rethink a lot of things about what you typically do in an online platform that don't necessarily work in online platform, but you've been doing um, in, in a brick and mortar class. Um, this image is showing there's a, a, a software called DigiZam. And it allows you to administer an exam, a remote exam, where you give students a password and they go into the computer and the, 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 the software completely shuts down all the other programs on the computer. So they can't go to another web browser, they can't open up you know, uh, an encyclopedia, they can't open up any other um, programs on their, on their computer. So one thing you have to think about are your assessments. Do you have a way to have secure assessments? Um, it also means that you might have to rethink maybe tests don't work for you in this new new way of teaching and learning. And maybe you're moving to a more project-based way of teaching and learning. 
Um, but I would say, you know, I know folks that have used DigiZam and other apps that are security, uh, are security systems for your exams. But I would say there's always a way to get around those, you know? So if a student is doing the test on one device, they can use another device to circumvent the system. So, so I, I think what I'm saying is that if you have to do the normal tests, think about how you're gonna do that in a secure way. And if you can open up your assessment to other ways of assessing students, that might be the way to go as well. So really be mindful about your content, the tasks you have your students uh, do, and the assessments that you have your students take, because they might it might not be it might not lend itself to the online platform. So uh, Hassan, you're saying that in any case, whether it's brick or mortar, whether you're doing online, you're, you've got to think about doing it in a hybrid format, right? Even though yeah. even though one day we'll go back soon, probably to brick and mortar, we still have got to to embrace this online uh, online culture because it has got its own strength. And uh, even if you don't go back in a in, in a long time, we have got to find a way where we can uh, sort of uh, create a face to face session with them. So that, that is the challenge that we have we are facing uh, right now, I suppose. Uh, what about this DG exam? Is this something proprietary or is this something that is on the web that we can uh, use? So it, it is paid. It is um, so there's a, there's a way to get individual licenses, but also a campus license. But it is paid, so um, it's not a free thing. Um, but there are other there are other um, platforms that are free, but may not have as much security as Digizam. Okay, and, and uh, in your case, is a proctored exam. And an important feature, is it something that you take as seriously as, you know, you have to see your students in front of you and, and so on? So, yeah, so we do have, we do have some educators that are doing that. Um, and part of my job, actually, I meet with students who break rules. So there are, there are times where students like, cheat on a test and they have to meet with me and, and um, you know, I can handle that situation. So yes, I know there are teachers who, for example, I know there are math teachers who are still doing the normal um, te the test, and um, they have to submit, they have to uh, face the camera in a way that the teacher can see that there's nothing around them, um, and then they have to take a picture of their work and send it to the teacher. That yeah. students still find ways to get around that system. I, I, I mean, if students are motivated to get around the system, they will. Um, and I'm finding that, especially in math, that there are these new um, programs and platforms that allow students to take pictures of, of a math problem, and then it will show them how to solve the problem. So, so students are finding ways to get around the rules and, and, and cheat, unfortunately. Um, so, so yes, you can have security. Yes, you can have live proctor exams with cameras facing them. And yes, students will still find ways to get around it. So uh, <laughs> they're motivated. Um, continuing with learner experience and, and content. Um, you really have to think about how you're engaging your students. And, you, and as I mentioned the MOOCs earlier, that the MOOCs are notoriously, have notoriously low rates of completion. So there are thousands of people who intend to finish a MOOC. They, they, they create an account, they log on, and then you notice that they don't get through the first week or the second week or the third week, and they never finish the course. What you're finding is that some of these MOOCs are changing what they're doing and they're giving opportunities for students to interact with each other or to interact with the teacher. And the, the hope is that that is going to increase um, the completion rates of these MOOCs. Um, 
And so what I find in online classes, you have to find a way to get students engaged with each other, with students to engage with you, and for students to engage with the content. Um, so a couple of tips around that is that when you have an assignment, for example, this was an assignment, there was a slide deck or something that students were working on, and they, I, I, I required them to make it as a Google slide deck and to share with me before the deadline. So while they were working on it, they had at the beginning when they created the document, they had to share it with me. And so what I would do is every couple of days, I will go on to the slide decks and I would leave comments for my students. So even though it wasn't due, they still had another week or two weeks to finish it. The fact that I was going on and leaving comments for them, that was a way for them to engage, to, to engage with me. They would respond to my comments. I would give them feedback. And what was happening is that two things were happening. One is that I was catching errors or mistakes or giving them feedback before it was due. So I was getting better quality work because they I was helping them in the drafting process. And two, they were constantly engaged. So if they didn't go on and make changes, you know, every day or every two days, I was aware and I could reach out and say, hey, I noticed you haven't worked on this assignment for a while. What's going on? And that allowed me to intervene if there were any issues. Um, so I'm hoping that people have an idea of what I'm trying to say here. What do you think is the tip here? So uh, what I'm saying is that I want yeah. you to engage and interact with students. I want you to let students interact with each other and to get feedback. So another way you could do this is this, there's a twist on the group assignment that when you have group assignments, sometimes what you could do is make the assignment individual, but the group is actually responsible for giving feedback to each other. So yes, they're creating their own work, but their group that they're sort of working with is not actually partners that's working on the same assignment, but they're actually leaving feedback for each other. And, and that's another way to get students to engage. Um, and so here is, this was a wiki project assignment. And then what I did is I had students leave comments on each other's presentations and each other's wiki projects. Um, and so again, that was another way for students to engage with each other to leave feedback with each other and just increases the chances that students are going to engage with the content. Um, Hassan, so I see engagement is a very important uh, exercise or feature uh, that you're suggesting. That's why I hope you begin with communication as your number one uh, sort of important point to, to consider as an online educator. So in your instance, do you determine what form of communication that you use as, as a formal uh, communication? And, and, and is there informal that sort of complements it? Is that how, how do you sort of plan it? So the first, thing, the first thing I do from day one is I explain, this is how we're going to communicate with each other. These are the acceptable ways um, to communicate because you don't want there to be any confusion. You don't want students to get lost. So if they have a question, they know that in, in my class, this is what you do. You know, this is the first step you take. This is the second step you take. So, yeah, I think you want to determine and you also want to set boundaries. So if you know that you're, you're only going to check your email once a day or once, you know, once every other day, you want to make sure you're clear with your students about that as well. So if you need to set boundaries and say, I don't check emails on Saturday and Sunday. They know that so that there's no confusion about your expectations. Oh, that, that is very great. I mean, uh, I think most of us, uh, we, are, we are still finding ways to communicate. In the end, we would say that our students are not cooperating because 
we do not uh, inform them early on that uh, you know this is the this is the route to reach me and this is how I'm going to reach you. Uh, and uh, so I think putting it all of that out in the in the first few days is very very uh, important. And I like the way that you left the breadcrumbs in 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 your session, especially when students are doing. Uh, um, the assignments to just go in and then just mention something to show that you're still around, uh, although you're not actually in front of them, and so they can pick it up and see your thoughts and movement and act on it. So that that is that is an interesting way of uh, just monitoring their presence and and their thought processes. So it's exactly yes. You want to make sure that you, it's all about communication and engagement, getting them engaged. Um, so th this is, shows uh, a, a discussion board about content in my class. And notice a few things that I am being very clear about when they should post. Because when I first started teaching online and I had my discussion post, what I realized is that students would submit their discussion post at the very last minute. So right before the deadline. But as you can imagine, if it's supposed to be an online discussion, it's not a discussion anymore. It's just people just kind of blabbering, saying what they want to say, and there was no dialogue. So what you have to do for your discussion boards is you want to you want to stagger those deadlines and say you have to leave a post, post number one by this date, post number two by this date. You have to respond to someone by this day, et cetera, et cetera. Um, because if it, if it really is supposed to be a discussion, then there should be interaction between the students. So you want to stagger those deadlines. So when you're using those online discussion boards, you want to give guidance about how many posts, when they should post, um, the quality, what are you looking for in posts, um, because what you don't want is just people kind of leave comments and then all they're doing is say, yay, that was a great point, I agree. And that's not helpful. That's not a discussion. That's just people responding but not advancing the conversation. So you want to give some guidance about your, your discussions. So, so in, in, in a way that you're breaking up the conversation into small bits and pieces, and then uh, you're, you're telling them that, look, this time around, we just focus on this, and this is what I expect of you, rather than putting it all in one big session where everybody in the end gets confused. Because I think confusion is the most uh, most prevalent uh, culture. If it's on, online, if you're not guided it well, I suppose, Hassan, is that, is that where you're coming from? Yes, exactly. I think it's about about you know you don't want and this is going to sound weird but you you want to limit their excuses for being unsuccessful in their class like you want to take away any excuses that they have you know oh i didn't know i was supposed to do this oh i i could i couldn't i couldn't find this oh i don't know what the deadline was you want to get rid of all those excuses from the beginning and structure your class so that they, they can be successful. Okay. Um, just a few more things on learn content. And I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go quickly through some of these so I can go to the last session, the last um, category. Um, but I think I think you probably already know this because a lot of your content is hands-on, but I just want to make the point that in the online class, you should definitely still have hands on learning. You know, um, you want them creating things. You want them off the screen to do some of these activities. Um, you, you know, I just I can't say enough how important it is to get them doing stuff. So it's not just about, yes, you can have your online simulations and I, I have online simulations and simulations that they, they can do online to collect data and data sets that they can analyze. But I also want them creating things. So are they building models? Um, if it's an art class, are they making art? You can have them create videos. Just have them doing stuff that's beyond just typing stuff on a screen. Um, because there are, you know, if you're doing online classes, obviously they're on the screen. 
So you want to make sure you're also connecting that to some um, hands-on learning. But things to think about when you ha have hands-on learning is that it does take preparation. So before I mentioned on the left that sometimes I have students submit their plans. So yes, sometimes with some of their hands-on learning stuff, maybe you want to have them submit a plan in advance. The other thing is on the right, you see that they, you also want to communicate what kind of materials do you need? And you want to do that in advance. So I, I had a, a DNA extraction lab and I told them a week in advance and I sent them an email and said, look, even though we, we're not learning about DNA extraction right now, there will be a lab and I need you to go and get these materials, you know? And, and so the last thing you want to do is they're about to do a lab and they don't have the materials. And that, that's, that makes them um, be behind. Um, so you want to sort of prepare, you want to make sure you're prepared for the online, for the, uh, that, sorry, the hands-on learning. Um, a, and, question, and if you, a question, Hassan. I mean, yeah, it, it is, uh, it is a practice, it's a good practice to have students coming up with practical uh, inputs and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but there's also an argument that from the student's perspective, if Every lecturer requires them to come up with a painting or a drawing. Uh, wouldn't you think that would be boring and be overkilling the whole uh, experience? You know, I mean, uh, it's the same thing, so it becomes burdensome to them. Is that how? What was your take on that? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I, I'm not saying that every single thing you do has to be hands-on. What I'm saying is, don't forget about hands-on learning, right? So. You know, I think, yeah, if just like if if everything that if students were only writing papers or only doing lab reports, that would get boring and tedious or always doing tests that would also be boring, and tedious. So mix it up to have a, a mix of things. Maybe there are times where you want to give students choice and say for this learning target, you, you have a choice as to what you want to do. But I'm saying just don't forget about the hands on learning. And, and when you do hands-on learning, you also have to think about how are students going to show evidence that they did it? Um, so you want to be mindful of that as well. So, you know, I might have students create a video where they, they show their model and they're talking through their model and they're recording it. Or maybe there's an image if they're doing a lab. I also want you to take an image of your lab setup or, you know, when you show, show the steps of the lab, you have to be in a video. So just be mindful of how they're going to show evidence that they have done uh, what you want them to do. Um, also related to hands-on learning is don't forget about group learning, collaborative learning. Um, so again, you know, the collaborative learning, again, that will increase the chance that there's engagement between students in your class and that will have them coming back for more. Um, so, you know, do you want students to, are they creating a website or a video? They can do that together. That can be collaborative. Are they, are they creating a social media campaign or are they leading a lecture in your class? You know, or are they um, writing an article or a blog uh, together um, as a group? So, you know, don't forget about hands-on learning. Don't forget about collaborative learning. Um, and when you do collaborative learning, you know, there are ways to have accountability. Um, so I really love if, if I'm having students work on things together, having them do a Google Doc where you're shared on it. Um, and in Google Docs, you can go to the version history and that allows you to see the contribution of each student and it's actually color coded. So you can go into the previous versions and see, oh, this person, did this amount of writing and it's color coded. So you'll be able to get a sense of how um, group members are, are contributing. Another way to also build accountability is to have like a survey. So you can have like a form or survey where you're asking questions about the groups to reflect on, on the work they've done. Um, a, a good, sometimes they're not completely honest. They don't want to get their group members in trouble. A question that I like to include in all these surveys is, would you like to work with this person again on a project? 
So maybe they don't want to throw their friend under the bus and say, no, this person didn't contribute. But if you frame it in a way that says, oh, I'm thinking about putting you together in a, in a group again, how, how, how do you respond to that? Then you're sometimes able to get more information. So when you do have the collaborative learning, you have to think about how you're going to hold each student accountable. Um, so that that is the third um, category. And I'm going to finish up with the final category for tonight. And that is on videos and video conferencing. Um, I think this segment gets a lot of attention in online classes because that's sort of the lifeblood that if you're having these WebEx webinars or these Zoom webinars, that's the way you get to interact with your students. Um, so videos are very important. The thing I would say is, and this is gonna be very ironic um, coming from me in this webinar is when you have video conferences like WebEx or Zoom or stuff, try to reserve that for your interactions. So the, the most interactive part of your class, you wanna put that on the video conference, on the Zoom or WebEx. Um, and if you want to give information, just create a video. Say what you need to say on video, put it on YouTube or wherever you host your videos and they can watch your video at a later time. So if you have discussions or debates or you want them to work together, um, you can do that on Zoom or video conferencing because you want to take advantage of, of the face-to-face -face time. So if you do have, if your course allows you to have video conferencing, maybe once a week or twice a week, you whatever the most interactive part of your class is, do that on the video conferencing. And then things that you just need to say stuff, like lectures or instructions or demonstrate how to do stuff, do that on video. I would say don't waste the, the great opportunity that you have um, with video conferencing. You're all together at one time and you can all see each other and talk to each other. So make the most of that time where you can have interactions and discussions. And if it's just you giving information, do that on video instead. Um, so it's just trying to make the most of your video conference time. Now going on to those videos where you're just giving information, use a variety, use videos for a variety of purposes. So I've already talked about the framing video in the top left hand corner. You see where you can use video to say, hey, this is what we're doing this week. Here are the major topics that we're talking about. And that's, remember, I showed you the, the image of the video of me walking around in my neighborhood. Um, so you can use video to preview a, a, a week or a unit. On the top right hand corner, you can use video as a lecture. So here I'm going to I have a PowerPoint slide and I'm going to talk over the, the slides and I'm teaching you concepts that can be done in video. Lower left hand corner, if you want students to use a website or some kind of tool, show them how to do that on a video. You don't have to use Zoom to show them how to do that. Or on the lower right hand side, if you have a hands on activity or a lab, you want students to do, show them how to do that on video. So video can be, you can use video for a lot of different purposes in your, in your course. And one thing that I would say is that there's this quote that's, um, that is attributed to Voltaire, um, this Italian proverb that says, um, the perfect is the enemy of the good. A lot of times when teachers are making videos, they spend so much time editing their videos, making a perfect video, they have animations and all that stuff. And I would say, don't spend a lot of time making the perfect video. Your video needs to be good enough to convey the point that you want to make, um, but it's the law of diminishing returns. The, there's a certain point in time in which you put so much work into your video and you don't get more learning. So, so there's some bare minimum requirements for your videos, 
Yes, you want to make sure your text and your images are large and they can be seen. If you're on a video, you want to make sure that you're using, right now I have light shining on my face so you can see me. If I were to cut off this light, I it looks different, right? It's harder to see me. So you want to have front facing light so that you are well lit. You want to make sure your audience, they, they can hear you. You want to have contrasts of color. So light text on a dark background or dark text on a light background. You don't want to have like, you know, you want to make sure there's contrast so they can see. Um, red and blue is always a terrible combination, right? You don't want to have red and blue or blue and red. That's really hard to see. Um, and keep your videos short. Um, don't have those 20 minute lecture videos. But you want to keep those videos under 10 minutes. Five minutes is even better. There's been research done on engagement in videos and um, one to two minutes, you get the most, the maximum amount of engagement. But if you need to give, go beyond two minutes, two to five minutes, you still get a good amount of engagement. Once you get past five minutes, people start, um, stop paying attention and stop being engaged. So it's better to have multiple videos than to have one long video. People just, psychologically, it's just harder to engage. Um, and uh, there, I, I think I would like to uh, remind everyone again of your, the, the, the previous slides that you showed just now on video that is so precious. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, misleading myths going around saying that you should spend a lot of time on your videos. But here you're saying that you use it uh, as precious as possible, uh, only when needed. I think in the last two slides that you showed us, uh, only use the videos that are showing, uh, the one before this, I think. Yeah, yeah, this, this is the one where you're teaching a, the next one, the one with the concept. Uh, yeah, yeah, this is the one. So only use a video when you're teaching a concept or you want to instruct uh, how to complete an activity or, or something. And, and the rest, uh, try not to use a video because the video can be such an expensive uh, uh, commodity for the students to use and to pay for the bandwidth. And as you say, it, it loses, it can lose its, uh, its uh, yeah, an object objectives when you use it over too much. So this is very, very important, I think, for us uh, to, uh, to understand today, especially when we are all talking about having synchronous teaching uh, much more or much uh, more important than synchronous teaching. So thank you very much for this. Sure, sure. Um, and I'm just going to finish up with saying that when you have your video, like your video lectures, consider a few things that can be helpful to your students. So for example, when they're watching videos, like movies, that's a very passive thing. But when you want them to watch a video to learn, that has to be active. So you have, have to teach them how to learn from a video, how to take notes from a video. So maybe you want to, for example, give them a note sheet where they're filling in notes for your video. Or, or maybe you want to have questions in your video where they pause and they act, they have to answer a question uh, about your, your content so that they're not being passive. Or maybe you want to have a discussion board where students can ask questions about your video so that you know what questions they have before the next time you have class. And also you maybe you want to have a form where they give feedback about the video so that when you have time to edit your video for future classes, you know whether that video was helpful or not. Um, so when, when, when students are learning from a video, you want to be able to help them um, and give them things that give them advice on how to learn um, from the video. And the last thing I'm gonna leave off with tonight today is when you have your video conferences, you want to set rules for your video conferences, right? So, you know, if the rule is they can't be laying in the bed and they have to, they, they can't have their pajamas on for the <laughs> video conferences, make sure you make sure you make that clear. 
Um, if they can't, if you don't want them eating during your video conference, let them know they can't eat through your video conference. So think about the rules and expectations and norms for your video conference sessions. Um, and so just be very clear about what they can and cannot do during those sessions. Right? And I will say that this is the list of, of um, concepts that I talked through today. Um, the link on the bottom is to the full guide that I wrote. Um, and I can, I can share that with Lula so she can share it with you. Um, that has, in fact, I have more than just these, but these are the ones that um, Uma, um identified as being important to talk about. Um, so you can, there are more tips in this document. Okay? And there's a one page that has a list of my tips and best practices. And then there's a link to a full guide that you can read more about these tips and best practices. Um, so I want to thank you for you know being attentive, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you so much, uh, Simon. So many things that you have taught us, uh, told us from the, the importance of communication and till the choosing the right uh, contents to be in a video. I have here a question here from one of the uh, uh, lecturers. Uh, this is this is something where you, you were talking just now. How long do you suggest? Uh, how long do you suggest the video should be for a four-hour lesson? Uh, so this is this is the uh, the whole uh, old paradigm problem that we're having. You know, um, in in a normal brick and mortar uh, pandemicless society environment, we'll be talking about hours when you're facing the students in a class in in a lecture hall and so on and so forth. But now in this environment with, uh, with using videos and, and using asynchronous and synchronous, uh, is there any sort of guideline that you should, can suggest how much time for synchronous, how should we use it, and what are the strengths of the synchronous? Is there, is there anything? Yeah, um, I remember the first video I made was on the digestive system. And it used to be, it was, I think, a 65-minute lecture on the digestive system. And, and when and I when I made my video, it actually turned out to be a 12 minute video um, because I realized that there was a lot of stuff that I was including that wasn't as important. And then a lot of time was um, spent on answering questions. Um, so what, when I realized that the most important stuff that I had to say, I was able to say it in a 12 minute video. And then I sent them to read some of the rest of the stuff. So you can have, so you have to think about how much of it can you send for students to read about on their own and how much of it do you need to actually express? So I would use the video to talk through some of the, the points that are, I think, more difficult for students to know that you, you know that students are going to have a hard time really understanding as they're reading. Um, so I would say, you know, again, I would say 10 minutes. And if you have to go beyond 10 minutes, I would break it into um, to, to more than one video and then consider sending them, sending them to reading some of the rest of the stuff. Oh, I think you're on mute. Oh, sorry. Uh, one, one last question for me. How do you overcome this digital divide that is going on, not just in Malaysia, I think in America as well, you have got this uh, uh, digital divide agenda issue going on. So how do you cater for students who are living in an environment where uh, they do not have any access to digital technology? Yeah, that's a tough one. And I think getting the scene in the school can help is I think really important. Um, I know in the beginning of this, what I used to do is I used to, this is when we had DVDs, but what I used to do is I would burn my videos onto a DVD or put it on a flash drive so that if they didn't have internet at home, they still have access to my materials through like a flash drive or a DVD or something like that. Um, and then I would also print out copies of my activities and send a packet with my the students who didn't have, you know, some of the Wi-Fi or internet connection at home. So you have to think about what can I, what can, can is there something that I can mail home 
or is there a way they can pick up a, a box or something or a packet or something? Um, so that might be a way to help with students who don't have the, the quick um, high speed internet. Thank you so much again, Hassan. Uh, I think our time is up. Let me just wrap it up in Bahasa Malaysia. Uh, stay, stay online. Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum sekali lagi dan pada semua yang telah mengikuti webinar kita daripada USA. Encik Hassan Wilson telah menerangkan beberapa faktor yang penting. Ada empat dia bermula dengan communication, uh, structure of the class, uh, learner experience. Dia juga dah bercakap tentang kepentingan menggunakan video. Uh, yang terakhir tu, the, the kepentingan menggunakan video tu agak penting. Uh, kerana kita tahu bahawa video menggunakan bandwidth. So, bila kita nak guna synchronous, bila kita nak guna video, apa kandungan video dan uh, bagaimana kita nak kaitkan dengan aktiviti-aktiviti yang lain. So, uh, thank you very much uh, Mr. Hassan. I think... Uh, this one hour has been quite uh, enriching for us to just to see how you are tackling your your the side your side of the world there and uh, with an online ex learning experience and this is how we are trying to adjust as, as well to our own um, strength and weaknesses so from all of us and from the Malaysian Polytechnics and uh, College Community Education uh, I would like to thank you for this uh, participation with us and and contributing and sharing of best practices. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Hassan. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Okay, semua terima kasih. Kita berjumpa pada pukul uh, tiga, uh, pukul uh, dua setengah, ya, dengan uh, satu lagi uh, yang terakhir, satu episode yang terakhir yang bercerita mengenai dengan bringing your content to live, uh, Puan Nazira binti Johor from USM. Uh, so ini adalah yang terakhir pada sesi kita pada kali ini So that will close up the session uh, So uh, see you then uh, hat, Macam tadi saya, think, saya kata This is a very special uh, presentation All the way from uh, Connecticut, uh, USA uh, Dia telah memberitahu kita Rupanya masalahnya sama Masalahnya masih ada digital divide Ada yang internet, ada yang tak ada internet So it's not just us eh? it's, uh, it's an all over issue Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum dan salam sejahtera. Uh, petani saya, Dr. Umar akan menjadi moderator. Right? Bye.